Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Hope uh, as well from me. My name is Cam, one of the uh, pastors here. Uh, that is this series of episodes where we're looking at in that passage just then today. That's what we're looking at. So let me pray for us as we come to dive in. Join with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for your son and your spirit. Lord, we pray now, as we uh, even looked at last week, that you would give us hearts, fertile hearts that are like good soil, hearts that are ready to hear and listen and see as uh, you enable us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's a movie uh, a few years ago now called Click. Uh, Adam Sandler's in it. Have a look. You might, anyone seen this movie, Click? Uh, 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 quite a few years ago now. But it's really about this, this guy who goes looking for a new TV remote. You know, riveting stuff, isn't it? Okay? It's, but the thing is about this, this guy, he also really is feeling like he, he, he needs more control in his own life. And so it just so happens that on his search that he comes across a universal remote control that can even control reality itself. So he has the, da- the barking dog outside and he just presses his remote, mute, and it stops. Right? And, and, and then he can pause life around him. He can rewind to past events, skip ahead to others. Like, wouldn't it be great to have that kind of control in your life? Just all that, literally at your fingertips. And I know you probably start thinking now, oh, what would I do with a remote like that? And, you know, how would I use that? Anxious about that dentist appointment? Skip. There we go. You, you feel like you've got that assignment that's looming and you just can't get onto it. You need to do something with the house. You, need, you just want more sleep. Just pause life around you, and then you can just take all the time you need to get ready and to, to rest and things like that. Brilliant, okay? Like, wh- wh- who here would like that kind of remote? It's the sort of thing that you just want in your hip pocket all the time. Uh, it's true, though, isn't it, that we, we all want a, a, a sense of control in our life. And I suspect that we probably don't, like, we don't want to go overboard. We don't want to be sort of control freaks, right? But we do appreciate and we want at least some sense of control. Because as we look at our world around us, right, it seems to be just so out of control. You know, you, you, you think of bushfires and floods, right? Even just this past couple of weeks. You think of disease and war. And then you just bring that home and you've got, you know, medical diagnoses, you've got issues at home, you've got stresses and strains and there's loss and heartache and there's ISO and you can't even control the trains at the moment. You can't control the, the, the roads. And, and then just to tip it all, like the, top it all off, you know, your kids on a windy day, no hope of controlling them. They just go crazy, right? We, we, we long for some kind of sense of control in our lives. Are you feeling in control? Are you feeling in control? Uh, Can I give you some good news this morning, friends? You don't have to be. You don't have to be in control. In fact, the reality is that you can't actually be in control. So how's that good news? Because when we realize that we're not actually in control after all, that's when we can also start looking and saying, oh, wow, Jesus, he's the one who really is in control. So we look to him. We turn to him. Uh, You see, in this passage today... We have four episodes, and they're really about people who aren't in control. Uh, They've both, all all of them have come to these sort of utterly desperate sort of situations, really to the point where they've gone, I just got nothing. There's nothing that can be done, nothing that I can do, and humanly speaking, nothing could be done. But it's at that point, that's when Jesus steps in. When nothing can be done, Jesus is able. So let's have a look at these episodes. The first one here, Jesus. uh, This is at the end of chapter 4, starting at verse 35. Jesus is in the boat with his disciples. This ferocious storm whips up. Waves are crashing into the boat. The disciples, remember, they are, many of them, experienced fishermen, and yet they are absolutely freaking out. Where's Jesus, though? Asleep. Can you believe that? During this whole storm, Jesus is asleep, and then another wave crashes and over over the boat, and so they wake Jesus up. Teacher, don't you care if we're going to drown? And what does Jesus do? He wakes up and he says, wow, somebody get the emergency beacon. This is really out of control. Is that what Jesus says? (laughs) No, not at all. He, He steps up, he yells at nature, rebukes it, silence, be still. You know, like, oi, quit it. 
Settle down, you nature. And it does. It listens to him that the storm stops. Have you tried doing that? I, I know. How good has this weather been in the last few days, right, after all that sort of deluge? But if we get more rain coming in this next week or two, take a step outside. Try yelling out. Just ignore the neighbor who's looking at you over your fence, right? See if the storm and the rain will stop. Give it a go. But when nothing else could humanly be done, Jesus is able. I mean, he does what only God can do. Uh, let's take a look back at Psalm 89 first. Psalm 89 reads this, Lord God of hosts, who is strong like you, Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging sea. When its waves surge, you still them. Or how about Psalm 107? Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a murmur, and the waves of the sea were hushed. See, Jesus does what only God can do. He is the all-powerful Lord of creation, totally in control. That's the first episode. Now, episode number two, they cross the lake, they get out of the boat, they meet a man who is possessed by an uncontrollable amount of demons. Look there, chapter 5, verse 3. Uh, this man, he lived in the tombs. No one was able to restrain him anymore, even with chains, because he, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had snapped off the chains and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And always, night and day, he was crying out among the tombs and in the mountains and cutting himself with stones. It's nightmarish kind of stuff, isn't it? And, and the gospel, other gospel accounts uh, tell us that this man was also naked as well, right? So you've got this, this naked, crazy Hulk guy kind of uh, bleeding, screaming, frothing, and running around, freaking out, not just the kids, but actually anybody else was there, and even all of the buffy guys from ta town come and try to secure him, chain him up, but he just keeps getting free all the time. Uh, you get to the point here of this scene, right? He, this guy's totally out of control. Um, he he's, uh, runs to Jesus, and the, the other disciples who were standing next to Jesus, imagine this, they just got out of the boat, and this, this guy, demon-possessed man, is running at them. What do you do? <laughs> you, you're freaking out again there. But what does the guy do? He falls to his knees at Jesus. Doesn't put up any fight. Falls at his knees of Jesus. What, the, the, the guy that nobody else could subdue is subdued by the very presence of Jesus. And he starts begging him. You notice there's no power struggle. There's no arm wrestle. No fight between good and evil because the demons in this man, they know exactly who Jesus is. Jesus gives them permission. He sends all the spirits into a herd of pigs. Now, again, you've got to feel something for these poor, poor disciples, right? They've just been freaked out by this uncontrollable storm. Then they've been freaked out by this uncontrollable naked man. And now they've suddenly got this 2,000-strong stampede of uncontrollable demon pigs running around towards them and about to drown themselves in the water. But like, what is going on here? It's chaotic. And yet, standing in the middle of all this is Jesus, completely in control. He's Lord over the natural creation. He's Lord over the, the supernatural, all these spiritual beings. Like, Jesus, he's the man. Yeah? Episodes 1, episode 2, episode 3. Let's have a look at this one. It's from chapter 5, verse uh, 24, picking up there. Uh, they, they've gone back to the other side of the lake. The crowd has gathered again. Uh, and pushing in all around Jesus, we see now verse 25... A woman suffering from bleeding. She's suffering this uncontrollable menstrual bleeding. Twelve years it's been. And she had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Now here we have an utterly destitute woman. I mean, physically she was probably anemic, right by now. Uh, she was fatigued, so worn out, financially exhausted in that department as well. 
religiously, relationally. Uh, By law, she wasn't able to go to the temple. Uh, She was cut off or wasn't able to interact with other people and have that kind of contact. She was an outcast, unclean, she was labelled. And so uh, after years of shame, she likely left broken, stripped of her self-worth. And again, there's nothing more, humanly speaking, that can be done for her. But Jesus is able. You see this? She, She touches his robes in verse 29. Instantly, her flow of blood ceased, and she sensed in her body that she was cured of her affliction. Now we come to episode four. We meet Jairus, a synagogue ruler, a big deal in town. He's not used to uh, begging. But what does he do in verse 22? Faced with a desperate situation, he too falls to the feet of Jesus publicly and begs him to come quickly, deal and, and, and heal his daughter. He was dying, and Jesus agrees. Jesus comes along with him, goes with him, but really Jesus gets held up by traffic, doesn't he? That's when this other woman, the, the, the sick and bleeding woman, uh, meets Jesus a- along the way. And Jairus, watching this, knowing that his daughter is dying back at home, must have been like, come on, man, come, let's, let's go. My, my daughter doesn't have much time. Let's go. But then verse 35. A messenger comes. This is what they say. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? And indeed, why bother? I mean, what else can be done? It's, it's a hopeless situation. But Jesus is able. He takes the, the girl's hand, tells her to get up. She does. She, she gets up. She's alive. <laughs> I mean, Jesus just raised this little girl from the dead. I mean, have you got the picture yet? So this King Jesus, in complete, absolute control, even over life and death itself, when nothing more, humanly speaking, can be done, Jesus is able. And I think this is what Mark really wants us to get here. He said, you're feeling like life is out of control? (laughs) That's right. But you don't also need to be in control. What you need to do is turn and see and put your faith in the one who really is in control. That's Jesus. And do you notice actually right across these four episodes, there's been this sort of um, common response to lots of the people in those desperate situations. You see, what, what was their common response? They were each afraid, weren't they? They were, they were fearful. They were afraid. Remember when Jesus calms a storm? He's just calmed it. Look at verse 40 of chapter 4. The disciples, to his disciples, he says, Why are you fearful? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified. I think now they're actually terrified at Jesus, having seen what he's just done, even more than the storm. And they asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. And then when the locals, they saw how Jesus had liberated the demon-possessed man, They were afraid. The bleeding woman, she is afraid to come forward. And what does Jesus say to the disciples, as, or rather to Jairus, uh, after his daughter had died? Don't be afraid. Only believe. Now, why were they afraid, right? (laughs) Because they're human. They're normal. They're just like us. They're afraid because they knew that everything just around them was completely out of control. And because they also hadn't yet grasped the extent to which Jesus really is the king who's in control. Uh, You know, like life can be pretty fearful, can't it? Uh, We can have irrational fears. We can have rational fears. Uh, Either way, the fear that we feel is still real, isn't it? Yeah, We feel... The fears of uh, circumstances. There, there, there are real, real problems, real stresses that we face. You know, we, we, we feel the fear of tomorrow because we're just not in control of it. We, we know the fear of, of the supernatural, perhaps. 
There's a real fear there that can be there, that, that of things unknown, things unseen, powers that we don't understand. And yet, I know some of us might come from particular backgrounds or cultures where we're a bit more aware of the activity of the supernatural, and there can be a helpfulness to that, but it also can embed a, 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 a fearfulness in us because of that awareness of it. We can also have a fear of just missing out on life. You know, kind of like FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. I, I, this is, I, I wonder, just the, uh, the fear that that's the everyday Aussie might, might feel. I'm not sure if this is you too, because I think often, is this true, that we think our lives are driven by our dreams, who we want to be, what we want to achieve. I wonder whether we are actually more driven, sadly, by our fear of our dreams not being met. Do you reckon that's true? It's like, what if I can't be who I want to be? What if I can't do if I want to, what I want to do? What, what if life just doesn't turn out how I hoped? And, and so we're, we're driven by this, and I always had this constant underlying fear of what might not be. And certainly, doesn't sickness and death really expose that for us? I mean, it's just these last couple of weeks, just to name a couple, right? Shane Warne, uh, Senator Kimberly Kitching, uh, both sudden heart attacks, aged 52, in many ways out of the blue. We are so not in control. So what's the answer to our lack of control? What's the answer to our fearfulness, right? Uh, is the answer for us just to eject God completely? Like This, this is the idea that the, um, the atheism would have us believe in and, and would try to sell us. That, that actually what you need to do is to liberate people from belief in God, liberate people from religion, and then, then you actually liberate people from fear. I tell you what, Having uh, looked at our society, do you think that we uh, have got rid of all fearfulness in our society? No way. If we have cast off God, you only need to look at our Facebook feeds and you see how anxious and fearful our culture and our society and our friends still are. Maybe us too. Okay, well, if that's not the answer, then what is the answer for us just to try to keep holding it all together personally, right? Maybe you feel like you're the one that has to hold it together, not just for yourself, but you need to hold it together for other people. You need to hold it together for your family. And if you don't hold it together, then it's all just going to fall apart. Is that, is that what you feel like you have to be... How, are you tired of just trying to hold it all together? Or maybe the answer is to our lack of control. Maybe we've just got to give up. Just... Just fall into despair. You know, just put your hands in the air and just go, I've got nothing, whatever, uh, it's hopeless, I'm done. Do you feel, is that where you're feeling at the moment? In that pit of despair? You don't know what tomorrow brings, you don't even care really because it's not going to change. Or is it this one that we need to knuckle down and try to seize and take even more control of what we have? just to bring some sort of sense of it into our, into our lives. Um, there's a, a, a Christian thinker and teacher, Michael Reeves. This is what he says. He said, if you want to be anxious today, pretend you're in control. If you want to be anxious today, pretend you're in control. It's true, isn't it? So what are we to do then? Because it seems that no matter what we, we do or experience, that whatever we try, we're reminded that we are just so not in control and that just seems like a slippery slope, slope to a life of fear. And yet, do you know what actually the, um, the most frequent command in all the Bible, do you know what that is? It's, it's not love God or love one another. It's don't be afraid. That's, that's the most frequent command in one form or another in the Bible. Don't be afraid. In fact, one of the big questions that we have in these four episodes from our passage today, right, is this. You might, did you notice this? It's will you have fear or faith? It's, it's, it's fear or faith. Or, or will you have faith even in the midst of fear? The, the antidote to a life of fear is this. It's, it's faith in Jesus. Now, we need to clarify what, what faith actually is, right? Because faith is more than a, uh, a recognition 
of who Jesus is, okay? Because you remember, actually, in our story, we're told about the demons, and, and they knew exactly who Jesus was. They said, actually, they said that loud and clear, son of the most high God, they say. They know, that they know exactly who Jesus is, and yet they still don't have faith, do they? Uh, I guess, in a way, you might, um, that might actually describe where you're, or what you're like, where you not that, not that you identify with the demons, right? But, but actually that you, you, you know who Jesus is, in a sense. You, you recognize him. You know about him. But can I say, friends, that knowing about Jesus is not having faith in Jesus. Faith is about trusting in Jesus. It's about leaning on Jesus. Uh, can, I, can I give you an illustration? See, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like sitting on chairs, now, uh, Philip Jensen, who, who spoke with us a couple of weeks ago, this is actually an illustration I've heard him use from many, many years back. So I'm going to use it now. I find it really helpful. Uh, now, you, you can look at a chair uh, and you can assess and know all about the chair, can't you? Yeah, I mean, you can see its materials, its design, its sturdiness. Uh, and uh, really, you, I mean, you, this is what you've done. You, you've come in this morning and without realising, you come and sat on a chair, and what have you done? You have put faith in the chair that you're sitting on. Uh, was that a good decision? Well, I think so, because I haven't heard anybody fall over yet, or the chair claps beneath them, right? So the, the chair is able. And you know what? Jesus, he's so much more able. Uh, he's worthy of your faith. Because he's in control of everything. I mean, he, he's the Lord of creation, the natural. He's the Lord of the supernatural. He's the Lord of life and death. I mean, he's the son of the most high God. As you're sitting on your chair, you are exercising faith in what you're sitting on. And here's a question for you, though. What is holding you up? Is it your faith? Or is it the chair? It's the chair, isn't it? The chair. Is, you, 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 the, the faith is a necessary thing to, to express confidence in the chair, and your chair will prove whether it's worthy of that confidence. Isn't it the same with Jesus? What we have here is a king, the all-powerful king, and our faith is in him. He's got you covered. He will prop you up no matter what life throws at you. But still, people will say, you know, you know why life is out of control for you? You know why healing hasn't come, right? It's because you don't have enough faith. And they might even quote verses like verse 34 that we saw uh, before, where the woman, where Jesus says to the woman, your faith has made you well. Friends, please do not listen to that kind of thinking. It's, it's unhelpful. It's wrong. It's dangerous, right? God doesn't promise like an equation that with faith will come physical healing. It's not a matter, just have enough faith and God will heal you, have enough faith and that life will be swell. That's not God's promise. We don't have faith to control God. We have faith in the God who is in control. There's a difference. And our faith is in Him, again, no matter what happens, even if, physical sickness, or otherwise comes. Anyway, I'm not so sure that we're meant to see this woman, this bleeding woman, necessarily as the poster girl for great faith anyway. Uh, she even seems to have this almost misplaced faith. Uh, see here in verse 28. Uh, when she first sees Jesus, she says, if I can just touch his robes, I'll be made well. Like she's almost treating Jesus, or even his robes, like almost in a superstitious kind of um, sense. Like if only if I just touched them, touch that, touch that object. It's like she she recognizes uh, the powerful that Jesus is powerful, that he's holy, but she hasn't seen yet, hasn't worked out, and know him as one who is to be personally known, to relate to. And and it's true, isn't it, that in, like in the name of Christianity. People have become so blinded by holy relics 
holy places, holy water, holy people, holy prayers, holy experiences, and holy moly, they've missed Jesus, right? It's all about Him. It's about knowing Him. That's what it's about. Now, look, I don't know. Maybe I'm being a bit too critical on this woman here. I mean, after all, look at verse 27 again, and let me show you something. What does she do? She hears, she comes, and she touches. I mean, if we break it down on that level, like, she knows in some way that Jesus is the one who could fulfill her hopes, and so she comes and seeks him, and she finds him. That's got to stand for something. I mean, it's not because she's touching him, per se, that she's healed. I mean, remember, everybody else was pressing in against Jesus. So it's not just that she was touched him and nobody else did. Everybody's doing that. But it's because of her faith, even her little faith, even misplaced in a sense, perhaps. Faith as small as a mustard seed. And Jesus honors it. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And be free from your affliction. Now she, she came that day looking for physical healing, but actually we, she would walk away with something more. We've got to remember that these miracles, they are pointing to a much greater reality. They, these miracles, they're pointing to who Jesus is. They point to what his kingdom is like. They point to, indeed, actually what our own spiritual reality is. Because you know what? Our, our sin, humanly speaking, because of that, no, no, nothing can be done for us. We, we can't do anything ourselves. We, each and every one of us, have tried to seize control of our own lives. We've tried to seize control of our own world. And that does, does not work whatsoever. We've tried to seize that away from God, the God who made us, the God who, who rules everything. And that sin, we're told, it, it ruins our lives. It ruins our world. It ruins our relationship with God. And that has consequences. Our shame is deeper than the sea. We are shackled by our sin. We are, we are captives to the evil one without Christ. Not necessarily in the sense of demons, but actually just in the way that he, can, he continually accuses and reminds us of our failings. The accuser. We're spiritually sick and broken because of our sin. We are dead in our sin. All these different images that the Bible uses and gives us. And what does it give? What kind of picture? Hopelessness. We're hopeless. Literally, without hope. Humanly speaking. When nothing else can be done, humanly speaking. But Jesus is able. Like God, he doesn't promise to be healing our bodies. But what he does promise is that if you come to Jesus in faith and repentance, trusting in his death and resurrection, your sins are forgiven. You are forgiven of them. You are rescued from the greatest storm. You are freed from the shackles of sin. You've been healed. You've been made a child of God. You've been raised again to life everlasting. That's what he promises. And that's what he gives. We put our faith in Jesus, the one who's completely in control. Friends, will you do that today? Like, is this you? Do you need to let go and submit the, the, the little control that you might feel that you have and, and give it all to the one who really is in control? Will you give it to him and trust him for your life, for your salvation? Maybe today you've been going, oh, like those disciples, you've been struck by who Jesus is, the kind of power and authority and control he, goes, he has, and you go with the disciples saying, Man, who, who is this man who controls even the, the wind and the sea? That demons submit to his very word and presence, who has power over life and death itself. If they're your questions, if you want to find out more, can I encourage you? Come along and check out a fresh look, this course that we'll be running in the start of term two, to get into asking the questions about who Jesus is, so that you can find out for yourself with certainty why he's come and why he matters to you. But friends, if this is already you, if you're someone who has already come to put your trust in this king of glory, then friends, take courage. 
take courage in that. You know, because a life of fear leads to despair. But in Christ, we can take courage. You know that, that, that most frequent command of the Bible, do not fear, you know, it's, it's, or, or do not be afraid, it's usually coupled and accompanied by something else. What is that? Don't be afraid, for I am with you. That's what usually comes with it. For I am with you. And if you've put your faith in Jesus, you are united with him. And he has put his spirit in you. He's with you, friends. He's with you every day. In every uncontrollable moment, he's with you. So take courage. You don't have to fear the evil one or demons. Remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jesus, he's, he's described as the stronger man. Satan, yes, yeah, the strong man, but Jesus is the stronger man who ties him up. He shows him who's boss, right? And, and this might be for you too to know that what Jesus has done there, he's done most of all at the cross, where he has defeated Satan once and for all. You don't need to fear him anymore. Take courage, friends. Friends, take courage because you don't need a fear tomorrow. And with that, you can face tomorrow. You can face it because you, in, uh, by faith in Jesus Christ, you know he's with you. That doesn't mean that tomorrow is going to work out how you, are, uh, how you want or hope. But you're still a child of God. You're still safe in his arms. So take courage. Take courage, friends, because you don't need to fear death because will Christ has secured eternal life for you in the very kingdom of God. Isn't it a wonderful thing that by faith in Jesus Christ, we can come to God, the God of the universe, can come to him in prayer, that we can call and know him as Father, And he delights to hear from you and he will answer your prayers. Again, not always and necessarily how we hope and how we pray. But what does Paul say in Philippians 4? Let me finish with this thought. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Take courage, hope. Take courage. Jesus, he's the one, he's the king who's in control. Let's pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you that you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are King and rule over all. Thank you for these episodes, miracles, demonstrations of who Jesus was and continues to be, the one who is in control, the one who rules. Lord, help us to see him. Give us those eyes to see uh, what he's on about and why we can and why we should trust him, put our faith in him, lean, depend, uh, especially when we feel we have nothing left because chances are that's exactly what it is. We've got nothing left, humanly speaking, but help us to know and rest, to take comfort and courage in knowing that Jesus is able. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen.